Come on, let's go. This is crazy. I'm, I'm in awe right now. That was definitely the most unique NFL draft season that we have ever had. And hopefully this is a one-time experience that we'll be able to remember forever, but also one that they can take away certain aspects of the virtual draft for the future, like having more live broadcasts from players that just don't feel like going to the actual draft itself. And it was great to have sports back, but the only thing that was missing is that we need an official winner or loser for it to be a sporting event. Y'all want us to grade y'all like suburb kids. Get y'all participation wars and effort. So here I am with your 10 winners and losers, five on each side. And because so many teams seem to have added so much talent in this loaded draft class, it was really hard to pick just specific teams that were winners and losers. So I have individuals as well as teams scattered throughout this list. Let's get right into it. Hit that like button. The goal on this video is 1000 likes. Thank you so much. Next video out will be my 2021 early mock draft. You can look for that in the next week. Week. And then we are putting draft talk aside and we are breaking down the way that these teams are set up moving into the 2020 NFL season. Let's start with the team that can probably be penciled in as a winner in the NFL draft in most years. John Harbaugh was so worried about being hacked and I don't blame him for being concerned when you've got one of the best scouting departments in the league. It also doesn't hurt that the Seahawks pass on the second best off ball linebacker in this draft right before the Ravens got on the clock and filled their biggest need with a day one starter in Patrick Queen. But they also doubled down on linebacker and selected Ohio State's linebacker Malik Harrison in the third round. These are two perfect complements for each other inside because where one may lack in an area, the other excels. Patrick Queen is smaller and faster and excels in pass coverage, while Malik Harrison is bigger and stronger and can really shut down the run. These guys should both start from day one together because they will need as many reps as possible heading into the playoffs in case they need to lock up that Titans running game again. But the Ravens are only getting to the playoffs again if their rushing attack continues to be as effective as it was in 2019. Mark Ingram was one of the better free agent signings in the last few years. He brought not only production on the field, but much needed energy and charisma off the field. But don't forget, he is a 30 year old running back now coming off a season where he had 228 touches. So instead of hoping last year's fourth round pick Justice Hill makes some sweeping growth in year two, the Ravens snatched up one of the best running backs in the draft in the second round and another Ohio State player, J.K. Dobbins, who profiles as a more explosive Mark Ingram. Dobbins is a big game kind of guy and shows up when it really matters. So now you have some insurance just in case that mileage catches up on Mark Ingram. And I low-key think that J.K. Dobbins might be just as productive per touch in the regular season as Chiefs first rounder Clyde Edwards Hilaire. But the Ravens just continued to crush it round after round with just great value at every pick. Also in the third round, Texas A&M Justin Matabuike is the perfect developmental down lineman to stash behind these veterans that they added in free agency. Texas wide receiver Devin Duvernay has got speed to burn. I was looking for them to add another speed threat like this in the draft, just so that you can keep that aspect in your offense in case Hollywood Brown can't stay healthy for 16 games. And they added two guards in a row to help keep that offensive line churning out the rushing yards with Tyree Phillips and Ben Bredesen. And then James Prochet falling to them in the sixth round was another steal just to add more depth to their wide receiving core and then capping it off with Geno Stone in the seventh round is just a testament to how thorough this front office is and that they don't reach on need and just allow the best players in the draft to continue to fall to them it really is impressive what the Ravens continue to do year in and year out and doesn't seem to matter anymore who the GM is as for our first loser, there's nobody that got a bigger kick in the balls than the once bad man himself, Aaron Rodgers. Not only did the Packers draft his replacement, they traded up to draft Jordan Love, which means they sacrificed resources because they wanted him so badly. But initially it's like, okay, sure, you're gonna have to pay for a future franchise quarterback at some point, but the Packers will use the rest of their draft picks to upgrade the weapons around Rodgers, right? Well, if you consider getting one of the most physically gifted passers of our generation, the pieces to run an offense from the 1950s, then yeah, they they helped him. After picking Jordan Love, his replacement, they added a 250 pound running back. And then in the third round, they took a guy that's listed at tight end, but he's 6'2 and looks a lot like Kyle Juszczyk, to be honest. Josiah DeGuaro was projected to go in the fifth or sixth round, but you know, take him in the third. Sure, why not? So after the first two days of the draft, the Packers got Aaron Rodgers, a dying breed at running back, and a utility man fullback. To solidify this throwback offense, the Packers drafted three offensive linemen in the sixth round, only to further prove that this draft class is living in the past. Their threesome of offensive linemen was kicked off with Michigan's John Runyon Jr., the son of former Eagles Pro Bowl offensive tackle. The major difference is though that John Runyon Sr. wasn't as physically limited as his son. Jr. played guard at Michigan because he's a legacy player, but he was lucky to get drafted and will probably never be an NFL starter. This was one of the deepest wide receiver drafts in a decade, and the Packers don't take a single wide receiver. They've either got a trick up their sleeve or they truly have had enough of Aaron Rodgers and the side of him that we barely get a glimpse of on 
TV. Now this trick that I'm referring to is trading for a veteran wide receiver. Now the draft is over and the Bengals landed T Higgins, maybe they'll feel comfortable releasing AJ Green from his shackles. But apparently Brett Favre reached out to Aaron Rodgers after this draft and recommended that he follow in his footsteps and finish his career elsewhere. And honestly, after this draft, it'd be hard to blame Aaron Rodgers for wanting to do that. The only issue is that Aaron Rodgers contract does not really allow the Packers to realistically get out of it for another two seasons. So prepare for this awkwardness for the Packers and Aaron Rodgers to carry on for another two years. Now back to the winners. After drafting Jerry Judy, I figured that the Broncos would address their offensive line with at least a draft pick or two. And then basically Vic Fangio would get all the pieces he needed to maintain their defense as the strength of the team. But no, the Broncos went all out for their franchise quarterback in this draft, taking three wide receivers, two of them back to back in the first two rounds, and then getting Drew Locke, his college tight end, who was projected as a future first or second round pick after his final season playing with Drew Locke. The two obviously had some chemistry at Mizzou and Albert O joins Noah Fant and Jake Butt and Troy Fumagalli. Who knows if all these guys even make the final Broncos roster, but this is easily one of my favorite tight end depth charts in the league. While the weapons for the passing game are going to be the headline grabbers for this Denver Broncos 2020 NFL draft class, it's the two run blockers that they added for the interior of the offensive line that could end up being the pieces that really take this Broncos offense to the next level and make this draft class a defining reason for their success. Lloyd Cushenberry III and Natane Mute are likely both starters in 2021, if not sooner. The KJ Hamler pick only reinforces though how much the Broncos had fallen in love with the idea of adding Henry Ruggs the speed to the offense and I even mocked Hamler to the Broncos once with the same pick when I had a run on wide receivers happening before they were on the clock but to get one of the top two wide receivers and KJ Hamler back to back that was impressive and I'm not one to give John Elway credit very often but this move took some balls so many GMs are afraid to go back to back like this at the same position because they're worried that they might miss out on an opportunity to address another need or even just the public perception of investing so heavily in your biggest weakness but if it's your biggest weakness then you need to add some depth there the Broncos identified wide receivers the places they needed to upgrade and all it takes is an injury to your first rounder and all of a sudden that hole that you filled rears its ugly head and holds you back once again and Rookies are usually very susceptible to injuries too, and might be even more so in the abbreviated offseason ahead of us. So I am definitely on team double dip or triple dip in this case. Wake Forest linebacker Justin Sternad is the sleeper of this Broncos draft class though. This dude has got it all. 6'3", 240, and he can run, cover, hit people in the mouth. He's coming off an injury, and that's why he fell into the fifth round. But his 2017 season was really good. He showed three down linebacker abilities. And if anyone can blend the 2017 and 2018 versions of him together in one defensive scheme, it's Vic Fangio. I feel like I'm gonna be a broken record with this in all the preseason preview videos that I do this summer, but please temper your expectations for rookies this year. I don't think that we'll see the injection of youth that we've become accustomed to over the past few years but Sternad will almost be a year removed from his torn biceps and could see himself back to form and ready to contribute early on especially based on the competition the Broncos have at inside linebacker he didn't get to play much in 2019 but his clutch interception in the season opener against Jordan Love is an example of the kind of guy he got here and then the other pick I really liked from this draft class was the cornerback from Iowa Michael OJ Mudia he's another sleeper in this and a quality developmental prospect for the Broncos he's got great size and speed for the position but he's not much of a playmaker just more of a lunch pail kind of guy that you can really rely on and that's what you need for filling out your depth chart. So yeah, Drew Locke got a heck of a team put around him for this season, and I look forward to him making a lot of strides in his second year, and those Chiefs and Broncos matchups are going to be epic. I don't know how to make you feel better about this Seahawks fans. John Snyder has got to stop overthinking this thing in the first round. The rest of the Seahawks draft was pretty solid, I'll admit, but when you botch first rounders on a yearly basis, you don't get the benefit of the doubt that even if Jordan Brooks pans out, he was a massive reach in the first round. So think of this as more of a lifetime achievement award for the Seahawks GM. If there was ever a time that he could have done his signature move to trade down and get his guy a few picks later, this was it. This year, more than ever, group think was a pretty obvious consensus around the NFL and team draft boards were probably as close to matching up as they will ever be again. And nobody had Jordan Brooks going this high. Now, reports out of Cincinnati after the draft have said that the Bengals planned on taking Brooks with the 33rd pick if he was still on the board. But that doesn't mean you pass up on Patrick Queen for Brooks. And how much do you want to bet the Bengals would have chose Patrick Queen over Brooks also, not only because he was a better prospect, but he was the college teammate of their new franchise quarterback. But there's no way that they were even expecting Queen to be in play in the second round. I'm usually pretty optimistic when it comes to taking your guy and I don't like to dump on the decision makers in situations like this but damn get Russell Wilson some help stop wasting these first round picks on secondary needs and I promise you Patrick Queen will be a better NFL linebacker than Jordan Brooks.
All right, and as for a winner, everybody likes to joke about Jerry Jones's yacht being the good luck charm for the Cowboys this year, but this was the Cowboys' first analytics-based draft, and I think that deserves the most credit for this draft class being a home run. The Cowboys have been habitual overthinkers over the past decade, and this time they just took the guys that graded out as the best players instead of trying to uncover gems with every pick. CeeDee Lamb is the headliner for obvious reasons and gives them one of the best trios at wide receiver in the NFL, but Trayvon Diggs is what made the Lamb pick a worthy gamble because he filled one of the biggest needs with a physical specimen that they felt comfortable taking in a first round trade down scenario. Neville Gallimore was another value pick. I'm also a big fan of drafting college teammates whenever it makes sense because it's like that feeling you had in elementary school on the very first day and you would see somebody from your class the previous year that you were friends with. You just get off to a much better start and feel way more confident in yourself when there's a familiar face around. But Neville Gallimore also gives the Cowboys a disruptive interior force along the defensive line and a really athletic guy that will prevent the defensive tackle position being a weakness or a hole for them if last year's second rounder Tristan Hill never pans out. And then landing Tyler Biedish as a potential Travis Frederick replacement was almost poetic. He's not Travis Frederick, but they're eerily similar and the Cowboys didn't necessarily need interior offensive line help, but they got a rival team to trade them a pick to get a potential steal in the draft. The storylines here write themselves. Reggie Robinson was also a sleeper coming into the draft. And then Bradley and I was a senior bowl standout that some people had going as early as the second round. He lacks a little bit of physical ability, but he's got a nonstop motor and is one of those like crazy wild personalities that you just need to have on every roster. I will admit though, the seventh round quarterback, despite being a local guy for me personally, was kind of a surprising pick. And it sounds like it might've been actually one that was more of a connection based pick from Mike McCarthy, doing a solid by making Ben DiNucci the pick. But the value that the Cowboys got in the first six of their picks almost grades out as if they had an extra first rounder. So much like the Ravens, they crushed it in just allowing the players to fall to them when they needed to. The Carolina Panthers spent all seven of their draft picks on defense, all of them. And don't get me wrong, I actually really like the move to draft a whole new wave of defensive talent for a team. Get the guys that Matt Rule wants to build around for the future and let Joe Brady see what he can do with what you've already got over there on offense. And now, after signing a long-term deal, Christian McCaffrey is the centerpiece of this Matt Rule, Joe Brady era of the Carolina Panthers offense. And other than some speedy young wide receivers, this team better have improved the defense because Teddy Bridgewater is not all of a sudden going to become LA you Joe Burrow in this offense. So what that means is that Christian McCaffrey is going to be getting a ton of touches again this year, and I just hope they don't run this poor guy into the ground. In fact, if there was a year to suggest that he nurse a sore ankle, get his body right for 2021 with a rookie quarterback, this would be the year for it. Otherwise, Christian McCaffrey is going to be seeing a lot of loaded boxes to run up against. Another winner that I had was Brian Flores. After they landed their guy at quarterback without having to surrender any extra draft capital, the Dolphins then went and secured the guy that they think can be a franchise left tackle and then used five of the next seven picks on defense, giving their second year head coach a plethora of tools to build his defense with. And now he's got the versatility to run a well-oiled Belichick defense. Of all of the Belichick disciples, he's definitely been given the most to work with going in and therefore I think has the best chance for some longevity in Miami. Noah Igbenogany was a surprise surprising pick after that strange situation where we thought they were taking DeAndre Swift and then traded back and then didn't take DeAndre Swift. But Noah Igbenogany will step in from day one and be a high-end slot cornerback with Byron Jones and Xavier Howard as the boundary corners. In a defense that relies heavily on cornerbacks being able to play man defense, the Dolphins have got one of the best units in the league all of a sudden. Raquan Davis is the pick that seems like the most people disagreed with because he's strictly a run stuffer. Never really got much better from that first year we saw him play at Alabama, but he's really good at run stuffing and that would be crucial in allowing the Dolphins to disguise looks on first down while also giving a break to last year's first round pick Christian Wilkins who just happens to excel in rushing the passer. Texas safety Brandon Jones is a versatile guy that can play either safety spots or as a nickel safety which is where he'll probably contribute the most as a rookie and it's UNC defensive end Jason Strobridge that might be the steal for the Dolphins and could eventually be an even better NFL player than Raekwon Davis. He's not as physically intimidating as Raekwon but he's a better athlete and the type of tweener that Belichick always found a home for in his schemes and I've barely even and scratch the surface of these sweeping changes that the Dolphins made along the offensive line because the best way for this Dolphins offense to help the defense is with an efficient running attack and now they finally have some guys to run behind and a veteran running back with a lot of potential in Matt Breida that they secured in a trade from the 49ers he's veteran enough to not be a rookie but doesn't have as many miles as a guy with the amount of experience that he does the only head scratcher here is that Austin Jackson was a surprising pick at 18 and I think they could have gotten him with the third of their first rounders but he's only 20 years old and is a solid athlete at the position 
season. He's definitely raw, but when you consider that he's only half of the compensation for Laramie Tunsil and you've still got the Texans first round pick going into next year, then I think that this could be a solid pick for the future. Now back to the losers, we've got another team that kicked their quarterback in the balls, and that was the Eagles. But hold on, let me start this off by saying I think the world of Howie Roseman and Hab at times over the past few years, wish that he was the GM of my favorite team because he's been incredible. I always felt like he was making the moves that I wish my team would have made, but their second round pick this year really confused me because poor Carson Wentz just dragged a group of practice squad wide receivers into the playoffs, essentially regaining his status as the alpha leader of this offense after Nick Foles came in and sniped a Super Bowl from him and then the Eagles go and grab another quarterback in the second round. I, I just, I can't even with this move. Right before the Eagles went on that stretch of easy games to take the NFC East in the back end of the previous season, I said in one of my weekly pickums that Carson Wentz was playing for his future as the Eagles starting quarterback. Some Eagles fans said I was crazy at the time, but I thought he responded well. In fact, no, he definitely responded well. You can't take that away from him given what he was working with. But self-confidence and regaining the confidence of the locker room were two of the bigger issues that he'd been facing and now you just crushed all of that confidence he built up last season with a single second round pick. I don't even know what's more damning, the fact that Carson's inability to stay healthy is one of the arguing points for this being a good move, or the fact that they drafted a quarterback that couldn't be more in contrast to Wentz to back him up. Usually you want a backup quarterback where the offense doesn't have to change too much scheme wise so that the system can stay in place. Well, that's not going to be the case for these guys. Jalen Hurts is going to need a completely different system installed if and when he comes in. Not to mention he is far too likable to be a backup quarterback. Whenever there's adversity for a football team, backup quarterback is the most popular position because there's a sense of hope attached to that guy. Imagine when the offensive line struggles for their first season without Jason Peters, whispers in Philadelphia are going to start saying Jalen might be a better option because of his mobility. Whenever Carson floats a dump off pass over a running back's head, the talk in Philly is going to be that Jalen Hurts could have made that pass. Maybe there's a plan here that we can't see. Maybe they think they'll be able to turn Jalen Hurts into a first round pick one day. Maybe they think Carson Wentz is fragile at AF and they don't trust him to last more than four years in the NFL. NFL. Maybe they think he's not actually very good at all, but wrote a Super Bowl roster to an inflated perception of his abilities. Howie Roseman said in an interview on NFL Network with Mike Garofalo that he regretted letting Russell Wilson slip out of their hands in the second round of the 2012 draft, and they ironically settled for Nick Foles in that draft. He said that he felt like he learned from that scenario, quote, what is the difference between taking a guy in the second round and the third round if you get a guy that is important player to your football team? He then went on to say that he hopes Carson plays until he's 40 years old, yada, yada, yada. But you know how you ensure sure that Carson Wentz is successful and they're in the Eagles as a whole have success, you draft the man an offensive line or a defender that can help his football team win the next day that football is going to be played. Not a quarterback that you hope will be there if and when Carson inevitably gets hurt again. The Eagles won the Super Bowl because they had built a roster that was so good a veteran backup quarterback could win with it. Luckily for Carson Wentz, he and his wife had a baby a few days after the draft and he's going to be so tired from this newborn stage that he might be able to get through this whole summer without even thinking about Jalen Hurts again until he sees him at training camp. Especially in these circumstances because when you've got money you can typically hire help to come in and help you raising a baby during the night. But with social distancing I'm afraid that Mr. and Mrs. Wentz are on their own here but good luck and congrats to them. Parenthood is a pretty life-changing event and who knows maybe this is the thing that Carson Wentz really needed to go from being a young man to a grown man and won't get nicked up so much now that he's got that dad strength. All right, and for my last winner, I've got Cam Newton. Bear with me. I wanted to put the Patriots on the loser side of things because they had a weird draft and drafting a kicker in the fifth round with a racist tattoo is a total loser move. But we should all know better than to call Bill Belichick a loser by now. In my last mock, I mentioned the JV and Clowney loophole that the Titans might have used to avoid losing a compensatory pick. And I think that the Patriots could be doing something similar with Cam Newton because Jordan Love was there for the taking for them, but the Patriots traded away. That doesn't make sense when Jared Siddham is your only option at starting quarterback right now. Jameis Winston was then signed the day after the draft, even though I, mean, I don't really think that he was ever a realistic option for the Patriots. Now we've reached the point where the teacher tells everybody to pick a partner and the last two standing are Cam Newton and the Patriots. I don't think that's by accident. I think that's by design. Bill Belichick's always been an admirer of Cam Newton and the physical abilities and traits that he has. And I don't think that Bill Belichick wants to start over with a rookie quarterback. I think that Bill Belichick wants to prove that A, he is the greatest NFL head coach of all time and B Tom Brady was not a system quarterback and Belichick can completely change his system and win with a completely different kind of NFL quarterback. Not only would Belichick get to end his coaching career with one of the most physically intriguing specimens to 
ever play the quarterback position, but he'd also get to prove to everyone that he was the engine behind the Patriots winning success all along. I saved the final loser spot for a special group. Despite everything that happened for their significant other, it was not a great weekend for two girlfriends of NFL draftees. First was the girlfriend of CeeDee Lamb. Now for a little context, CD was probably stressed to the max after weeks or months of hearing that he was the best or second best wide receiver in this draft, yet two guys from the same team were taken ahead of him. Then he's on the phone with the Cowboys and his girl, Crimson Rose, not sure if she's related to Amber or not, or if that's even her real name, but then she grabs his other phone and it looks like a classic situation where your girl decides she's gonna search through your phone to find something to get upset about, right? Now this was quickly debunked by both her and CD Lamb on Twitter, but the damage had already been done and she'll be getting looks from strangers like the one that his mama gave her right after he used that NFL hand-eye coordination to snatch that phone back from her. She'll be getting looks like that until the end of time as long as she's with CD Lamb. Of course, it didn't take long for the internet to run a background check on this girl and Trey Young got a little assist by putting his finger print on it too. Then the girlfriend of Isaiah Wilson was trying to console him and then got pulled off of him like a toddler by his mom. First of all, the camera angle here is so strange. I'm not sure if it was just a small area and they had to put the camera right on this man, but you can see her looking over at the screen like many of the little kids of the NFL GMs and coaches were doing. So you know they had a second screen so they could see themselves as well as the draft coverage. But after he gets emotional, she looks over to make sure she's in the frame while consoling him in the biggest moment of his life. Now, this is a man that is six feet seven inches tall over 360 pounds and somehow she managed to completely cover him up in the shot but then his mom said nah f that you didn't just get drafted this is my baby's moment and you do not get to steal the spotlight get up when she didn't take the hint and just sat up on him, Mama Wilson grabbed her like a toddler and tossed her right off of that man. I love Isaiah's reaction to everything that just took place. He got the most important news of his life, cried on national TV, and then watched his mom put his girl right in her place. And those are just two of the most hilarious moments from this past NFL draft. And hopefully this is a lesson learned for future gold diggers. Or Instagram models that think that they're gonna get a few seconds of fame by tagging along and being the plus one for these guys getting drafted. Russell Wilson's ex wife should be an example to all the girlfriends, but now we've got two more that we can add to the NFL draft wall of shame. That's gonna do it for my winners and losers from the 2020 NFL draft. I wanted to break down every single team, but man, that would have taken forever. The video would have been far too long. Everybody and their grandmother already has a draft grade reaction. I wanted to share though some of the things that I believed after being able to ingest everything that happened. And then I wanna give you guys a heads up on what to expect from this channel moving forward. Like I said earlier, my 2021 mock draft, way too early edition, will be coming out in the next week or so. I spent this past week also looking into who are some of the players that we should all have an eye on coming into this 2020 season and I'm pretty excited because it seems like a very top heavy class already and we've already got that quarterback combo at the top that should go number one and number two but then I've got a couple of quarterbacks that I think could sneak into that top five top ten discussion also but then after that I'm going to be putting all of my focus away from the NFL drafts for a little while and I'm going to be focusing on doing some really interesting things for the 2020 edition of these NFL teams so please if you enjoyed this video or any of my other NFL draft videos, hit the like button, subscribe so that you're notified when I make another one because sadly in this daycare that I'm living in right now, I do not have a regularly set schedule. My schedule is set by a four-year-old and two one-year-olds. So I appreciate you guys being patient with me and stay tuned for what I've got next and I will see you all in the next video.